Welcome everybody. I am Kathy Wallerstein, the Associate Director of the UC Davis Humanities Institute. Reimagining Stories from the Gold Rush is the first of three events in our series, Reframing Sacramento, a dialogue between artists, humanists, and community advocates, funded by a generous grant from California Humanities. By looking at the past and present of the city, this series seeks to ask, how can we sustain a Sacramento whose cultural, ethnic, racial, and religious diversity is celebrated, where values of racial and economic justice and equality are upheld, that is economically vibrant and a locale for innovations in the arts, culture, technology, and medicine in ways that enrich and celebrate communities rather than displace them. It posits that the way to ensure a Sacramento that maintains its diversity of peoples and expressions and that expands rather than contracts its artistic and creative offerings is by first understanding, and in some cases retelling or reframing the histories of the people who have made the city what it is. The other purpose of this series, which draws inspiration from a joint initiative between the cities of Oakland and Saint-Denis in France, members of whom will be joining us in our third event, is to begin to think of ways or contribute to discussions already underway about how different constituencies can work together with city officials, planners, architects, and so on to ensure a diverse, equitable, sustainable, artistically and culturally, culturally alive city. If this panel begins with a roundtable discussion of understanding and reframing the past, therefore I'd like it to end with a look toward the future. Please note that our next event in the series, Black Sacramento, will take place on what would have been tax day, Thursday, April 15th. You can sign up for that event on our website, dhi.ucdavis.edu. Um, we'll have a link on our main page very soon, but for now, you can get to it via our conversation page, dhi.ucdavis.edu forward slash conversation. And I believe that Gina will put that link in the chat for everybody to see. California Humanities requires that we ask our viewers to fill out a brief survey following the event. That link will appear at the end of this session and again in a follow-up email to you. In order to keep getting funding for programs like these, we ask for your help um, today by taking a few minutes to fill that out. Thank you so much in advance. I would like to thank the DHI staff and especially Gina for all your help in putting this series together. I'd also like to extend my deep thanks and appreciation to Veronica Candle and Milman Harrison for being my co-organizers and co-conspirators for these events without, um, without whom they would most definitely not be happening. <clears throat> the panelists will be doing two rounds of presentations answering two prompts, after which at about 6.10, we will open up the floor to questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A function and not in the chat function. You can post them there at any point during the presentations. <clears throat> we are of course holding this event and all of our events, whether virtual or in person, via UC Davis, which sits on the land of the Patwin people. I want to acknowledge the violent history of settler colonialism and the displacement and worse of the indigenous inhabitants of that land, a history that fast forwarded to today sees the Davis Humanities Institute sitting all too comfortably in their place. I hope that programming and conversations such as the ones in this series, which precisely posit that to look forward, we first have to look back and understand the past and understand how the past is imbricated and embedded within the present can increase awareness around these issues, not least for those of us who occupy the privileged place of institutional power. I also wanna take a moment to grieve the eight lives lost on Tuesday in Atlanta in yet another act of vicious hatred directed at Asian Americans and in tandem directed at women working in the sex industry, many of whom are not coincidentally immigrant and working class women. There are no words for how tragic this loss of life is, nor will the connection of these murders to the histories touched upon in this, se in this session be lost on any of us here. And now, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> without further ado, I wanna briefly introduce our panelists in alphabetical order and then let the conversation begin. Um, Tiffany Adams is an artist, painter, sculptor, jeweler, and culture bearer. Her work includes portraiture that utilizes articles and text pertaining to the feminine experience. 
Her work connects images and performance with current political and social issues. Tiffany has a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts. She may be running a bit late to the session as she was called to an emergency council meeting and I'm not looking at the screen so I can't see if she's here. She's not here yet. So, but we hope that she'll be able to join us soon. Chico Gonzalez is a Chicano educator, interdisciplinary artist, poet, and political and cultural activist and organizer. His work is archived at Sacramento State, San Jose State, the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum, among other collections. Veronica Candle is curator of history at the Center for Sacramento History, where she manages the artifact collections and uses them to develop exhibitions to help create a greater understanding of our past. Dr. Lorena Marquez <clears throat> is an assistant professor at the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at UC Davis. She is the author of the book, La Gente, Struggles for Empowerment and Community Self-Determination in Sacramento. Brittany Arona is an, an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe. She's a PhD candidate in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis in human rights at UC Davis. Since 2019, Brittany has been the Tribal Affairs Program Manager for State Parks, where she assists in statewide policy development, consultation, and collaboration with California Native American tribes. And last but not least, Dr. Cecilia Tsu is an Assistant Professor of History at UC Davis. She is author of Garden of the World, Asian Immigrants and the Making of Agriculture in California's Santa Clara Valley. I'm so pleased to welcome you all here. I've asked each of you to prepare a very brief four to five minute presentation on how your work touches on the past and present of Sacramento's different populations, histories, and cultures within the framework of this series. What different structures of knowledge, what different lenses of seeing and of understanding are brought to light in redressing historical omissions and understanding the full range of people's history. <clears throat> and I'll note for the audience, that while the gold rush is the frame we are using to discuss the past, not everyone is necessarily going to speak directly to it, and that's just fine. Um, for the second round, I've asked each panelist to imagine a future that draws on these multiple histories and cultures of Sacramento, and to suggest one or two ways in which artists, scholars, and community advocates and activists, such as all of you sitting around this virtual table, could be an, inter an integral part of urban planning discussions. What would that look like? So we're going to just dive into the first question, and I am going to turn the screen over to Veronica. Veronica, you'll have five minutes. Thank you. You're muted, Veronica. <laughs> I'm so sorry, um, thought I had that unmuted. Anyway, I, what I'd like to do is start out by explaining what the Center for Sacramento History is. Um, if we are the collecting entity for the city and county of Sacramento. We collect the history um, of both of those um, organizations as well as um, personal information from um, businesses, organizations. Um, and um, we also have three-dimensional art artifacts, um, which means that we collect um, things from everyday life of Sacramentans. This can be clothing, furniture, um, household uh, supplies. Um, we are what is called a full uh, range archives because in addition to three-dimensional items, we also collect, um, as I was saying, city and county records. and. Um, these include items that go all the way back to the origin of the city. Um, so deed records, mug books, um, diaries and letters from miners and people across the country. We also have a very large collection of news film footage from KCRA and KVIE. Um, and these include footage from the 1950s through the 1980s of events, um, local and national events that happened, um, us being the, the capital of California. Um, we have footage of the Black Panthers, uh, we have Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King. We have um, new stories related to integration of the schools here in Sacramento, fair housing, um, and um, uh, interviews with Nathaniel Colley. 
So a lot of our um, archives uh, relate to a lot of the different um, groups um, that have made Sacramento. And um, <clears throat> we utilize these collections in several ways. Um, we are the entity that develops exhibits for the Sacramento History Museum. And we utilize our artifacts and um, archives to develop those exhibits and also programming there. Um, we help out uh, providing material for their underground tours and their school tours. We have a lot of researchers that come in to use our archival material, um, authors, scholars, um, people doing family history. And um, we also have a um, lot of people who come in and use our film for uh, documentaries. Um, we've had uh, HBO and uh, other companies come in and uh, rent our film footage for their, their films. Um, we also collaborate with local organizations um, for some of our programming, including Soul Collective. Um, we've been working with them for a Day of the Dead program for seven, eight years now. Um, and we would like to be able to, um, to reach out and collaborate with even more groups as we go along. Um, one of the things that, that said in the museum field is um, so often our history has been about great white men. And that's what a lot of the exhibits are about also. <clears throat> and so what um, we found is that um, a lot of the exhibits have always told um, the history from the point of view of um, West, East Coast and Midwestern immigrants that came. Or if we have done past exhibits with groups, we've worked with the Chinese um, his, uh, Historical Society to develop an exhibit. It usually was about the history of that particular group. It wasn't about personal stories. And that's one of the things that we're missing is personal stories, personal objects from the people who actually came. Um, we, um, we also need to start talking about things like um, some of the historic uh, laws, um, Chinese exclusion law, the, the <clears throat> laws that said African-Americans and Native Americans couldn't testify against whites. Um, you know, we need to be able to get information and, and start working with groups to be able to develop our stories um, even more. Um, one of the ways we've, we've started to work on some ways that we, um, that we would like to develop more collaboration. Um, we are basically, when you look at it, the history of, um, we're the preservers of history from Sacramento from the beginning of the gold rush. And so we'd like to continue to do that. Let's see if I have any more time. Thank you, Veronica. Um, next up is Brittany. Starting my timer. Hey, I'm Kamalia Satina Juan, the Dekton Ante Ojoya, Brittany Arona. So, thank you for having me here for this conversation um, about Gold Rush stories in Sacramento. So, I'm actually from, grew up here in the Sacramento Valley um, with not very many stories about the Nisanan, um, Miwok, and Maidu, uh, Patwin peoples in the area. And that coming from a tribe in Northwestern California that had always kind of weighed heavily on me. Um, the really invisi invisibility that um, the wider culture had towards Native people, California Indian people, and California Native people are extremely diverse. We make up 113 federally recognized tribes, over 100 non-federally recognized tribes. And the gold rush is one very central part of the story of California. Um, so as I became a public historian, I began thinking about the ways in which um, our histories are very invisibilized in certain spaces, in schools, in uh, public memorials. And so I grew up going to Sutter's Fort and the California State Indian Museum in downtown Sacramento, as well as Marshall Gold, a state historic park. And as I began going more into this job at California State Parks, 
it really became apparent to me both the tribal advocacy that was happening around the history of Sacramento and the gold rush. So I really want to give credit to the tribes in this area for pushing on state parks to change those narratives. Um, it's really, really important to give the tribes and the tribal governments in this area the credit that they deserve for doing that. And they've been doing it for many, many years. Um, but over the summer, there was a call to take down the John Sutter statue that stood at Sutter Health for a very long time from, I think it was put up in 1987. So if you don't know who John Sutter was, he was uh, the first colonizer that came to the Sacramento uh, Valley and subjected the Maidu Miwok Patwin peoples into uh, slavery, um, sexualized violence, um, you know, rape, murder, all of the terrible things that we think about when we think about settler colonialism and Native American interactions um, that happened. And it happened here in the Sacramento Valley. But what we saw was this narrative uplifting, um, a settler narrative that uplifted this man's story above the stories of the Native people in the area. And so the tribes have really pushed on California State Parks to change that narrative and it's been happening. So we've been able to collaborate with the Capital District, which is the district that oversees Sutter's Fort and then Marshall Gold where the uh, gold was discovered up in Coloma, California and uh, been collaborating with staff at that level and tribes on um, reinterpreting those parks to include a more indigenized narrative. And that collaboration has really been at the behest of the tribes and working with them very closely on um, how that will look. And I think the point that I really want to make, both as an Indigenous scholar and as you know somebody that is working in this space, is that you can't do this type of work without working directly with the communities that you're talking about. Um, you know, Native people we know our stories. We've been telling these stories for a very long time. Um, you know, my grandfather has stories that was, were passed down about the gold rush that happened on the Klamath River. You know, we know our histories and it's been a long time coming that our voices are at the forefront of telling true, true history that is not always comfortable to people uh, to hear it, but it's really, really, essential to understand and to understand into the present because the past informs our present. Um, so I have about 30 seconds left, but I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, Tiffany was going to be next, but I think she's still not here. So um, Cecilia. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I am a historian of the United States and I specialize in Asian American history, immigration and race and ethnicity. And I haven't worked specifically on gold rush history but I have taught that history in several classes. So in Asian American history, we talk about the gold rush as it marks the first significant wave of Asian immigration to the United States. Um, so there were gold seekers who um, made their way from Canton, China to California. There were more than 20,000 of them in 1852. And you might have heard that the common nickname in Chinese for America was Gold Mountain. And the immigrants themselves, um, they called themselves Gam San Hat or Gold Mountain Men. And that became the term not just for the gold seekers, but for Chinese immigrants um, after them. And of course, as we know in that history, many of them, the miners found other economic opportunities in California and railroads, agriculture, in the industrial and service sector. Um, and, and then I also teach California history. I'll be doing that this spring. And I um, teach it with an emphasis on the diverse origins of the gold seekers, so Native Americans, Californios, African Americans, as well as miners from China. Latin America and Europe and how they were all part of the gold rush. And so to me, this is pretty standard stuff. Um, but th just this week, I got a wake up call that while to me, I think this is standard, this is what should be covered in, the, in teaching the gold rush. It's not how millions of children across the state 
are learning it. And so maybe like many of you listening out there in the audience, my children are doing distance learning at home. And I have a fourth grader. And as you probably know, in California public schools, uh, that's the year you learn California history. And so coincidentally, this week, the social studies homework was on the gold rush. And so you might have seen these um, newsprint pages. Um, and in four of these pages about all about the gold rush, there's just there's no mention of anyone non white, except for one Mexican miner. So definitely kind of foregrounds John Sutter and the kind of great white men in the gold rush. There are a few women mentioned. And, and so I think that the topic of this panel is really important and relevant. There are definitely omissions in the popular representation of the gold rush um, and its history. So a little bit more about um, my research. Um, so a theme that runs through my interest is how to use local histories to tell a larger national and global story. So I focus on Asian immigrants in the US and so I, th I think of these as often, they're, they're hidden histories. They're stories of people whose experiences have been marginalized and overlooked, who did not leave behind many written documents or historical records and are challenging to trace. And so this panel has really made me consider the importance of continuing the work to uncover local hidden histories in the gold rush era and beyond. So I'll talk briefly about how my research has attempted to do this. So in my first book, I focus on the history of Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino immigrant farmers and farm laborers in an area not far from where I am in Davis, the Santa Clara Valley, now known as Silicon Valley. And when I was growing up there in the 1980s and 90s, it was all about high tech and computers and microelectronics. Um, and it wasn't until graduate school that I began to learn about the long deep history of Asian immigrants and agriculture there and how fundamental they were to the agricultural economy and the landscape of that region. And yet that, that history was hidden and it was not known to, I think even now to many people who live there. And it was overshadowed by high tech, but also I think there's a way that Asian immigrants were written out of that history. And instead there was this myth that persisted that only white family farmers cultivated those orchards and farms. They did this independently without the labor of Asians and other people of color. And so the, the research from my first book eventually led me to another hidden history. So I became curious about how farming evolved for um, in the late 20th century for a different Asian American group. Um, at UC Davis, I've taught numerous Hmong American students whose families um, engage in small scale farming, mostly in the Central Valley. And probably like some of you, I've, fre I've frequented the stands of Hmong and other Southeast Asian uh, vendors at local farmers markets. And so I started delving into this history a few years ago, and I realized there was a much larger story to be told about refugee resettlement and the politics um, of the late 1970s and 1980s. And so I think the history of Hmong refugees is a hidden history. They're a small ethnic minority group from Laos that most Americans know little about today. Um, so when I teach this history in, in my US history survey class, I talk about the Hmong involvement in the secret war um, in the Vietnam War and how the CIA secretly recruited them and to fight against uh, communist forces and how they suffered enormous casualties and how this was the vital military alliance that allowed the Hmong to enter the US as refugees after 1975 and many of them settled in California in the Central Valley and also in Sacramento. And invariably students are fascinated by this, this history, they recognize its importance and they asked me, why haven't we learned this before? Why don't we know this? And so in the book I'm working on now, I'm trying to make this hidden little known history known and part of the central narrative of American history. And so that's kind of the, the framework I'm coming in with in thinking about local histories and hidden histories, how we can uh, foreground them and show how they can tell larger and significant stories. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Chico, you're up. Uh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Chico Gonzalez. I'm a Chicano artist and educator here from Sacramento. And I'm going to share uh, some of my work as an artist. And um, here we go. So once again, my name is Chico Gonzalez. I've been, uh, my work contributes to a long dialogue of art, art, activism, and the legacy of the Chicano art movement. Over the past two decades, um, I have produced thousands of posters for the, for the masses. And um, I know I only have five minutes, so I want to keep that in mind. 
and I'm gonna show you some, some slides uh, of my work in action. So a little biography, uh, my artist statement. Uh, and so, um, so back in uh, May 1st, 2006, we organized a big rally here in Sacramento. It was called a day with our immigrants. And we were able to, um, to gather about 40,000 people to march from Southside Park all the way to the state capitol. Um, it has been the biggest uh, rally that Sacramento has seen. And oftentimes it's overlooked. Uh, around the US, millions and millions of people uh, took to the streets uh, to protest uh, this bill called HR 4437 and we were actually able to defeat it. So here's one of the posters that I made for that rally. Uh, Viva la Mujer, Stop on Just Immigration Laws. Um, now, I made 160 posters by hand, uh, silk screen printing. Every color is a screen. So I did three screens and I utilized the white of the paper. And this is how it was used um, in the front lines. Prior to this, we were organizing and producing artwork and one of, the, one of the ladies that was collecting my work told me, Mijo, how come you're not uh, putting women on your posters? So I came, I came back and I made this uh, Frida Kahlo as Che Guevara because Frida was a, a revolutionary. Uh, and then I created this poster too, uh, featuring the Tanka Yotake uh, sitting bowl. Uh, it says, if we must die, we die defending our rights, no to HR 4437. And again, I made 110 posters and passed them to, to the masses. And here's uh, how they were used. So not only did I uh, participate as an artist providing artwork for the for the people, but I was also one of the organizers. Uh, back then, we used to have uh, an organization called Cahuil, a uh, campaign against unjust immigration laws. And we went to job sites where uh, Mexican immigrants were working, and we told them about this rally. And we gathered a lot of people to uh, come to the to the rally and march in the streets. Here in Sacramento, we have forty thousand people. Like I mentioned, it was the it has been one of the largest. Uh, rallies uh, in Sacramento, but El, El, uh, Los Angeles had about a million people that took to the streets. Chicago had about a million people. So all over the US, uh, people came out in support of immigrants' rights. Not only Mexicans, you know, there is this big thing about like thinking that undocumented people are like all Mexican, but there were like people like in, um, in Boston, a lot of Irish immigrants, undocumented Irish immigrants took to the streets to protest uh, this bill. And uh, here's another poster that I made. Uh, this was for the second annual um, Day Without Immigrants uh, is, uh, featuring Chief Joseph from the Nurse First People. And it says Tierra Robada, this is a stolen land. And I made 125 posters and I passed them to the people. This, this uh, particular rally was a little bit uh, less, um, not, not as many people came because around that time, uh, I, uh, ICE, uh, they were like doing raids all around uh, communities uh, of color all around the U.S. And here is uh, how the poster was used in the, the streets. So this lady holding the, the U.S. flag is the lady that told me, how come you're not making women, mijo? So uh, I made that for, for them. And um, around this time, I was teaching uh, Chicana, Chicano Studies at UC Davis, and we organized a rally there too against SB uh, 1070, Arizona's version of HR 4437 that eventually was defeated. And around that time, we were fighting to keep ethnic studies um, afloat too. Uh, there were some, um, some forces trying to dismantle that. Uh, and I supported the I Don't Know More movement when they uh, were organizing Canada's I Don't Know More movement. Uh, Native American uh, activists and organizers in our community here in Sacramento, they organized uh, two rallies and I supported those rallies by uh, making posters uh, for, for the people to enhance the voice uh, and the concerns of the people. And uh, I really love this, um, this uh, saying by the Cree Nation, only when the last tree has died and the last river has been poisoned and the last fish has been caught, will we realize we cannot eat money and protect indigenous rights. And this was a uh, digital prints, I made 150 and passed them to, to the masses. Then I did this one too. I'm looking at the clock and I'm running out of time. Uh, and here's how, you know, it was used on the streets. Then I supported the, the Muni Wishoni uh, movement, the Nodapo movement, by creating a, a poster and a banner and stickers and stuff and sent it to uh, North Dakota. And also here in town, we were uh, organizing. Uh, I'm a high school teacher. 
So I had all my high school students, I told them, you know, you guys wanna do uh, some, some online activism. And they said, yeah. So I took them to Southside Park, which is right across my high school. And all my kids were uh, having those posters. Here's a, a banner that I sent to uh, Standing Rock. Uh, with Soul Collective, um, Veronica mentioned Soul Collective. I'm, I'm a board member of Soul Collective. So Soul Collective was uh, uh, sponsoring all this work too. Here's my student by Ella LeBeau at the Grand Canyon with that poster. And then I started doing uh, our work for the women's marches. Again, right, uh, it was very, um, very white uh, in the sense that they had no women of color, uh, even though most of the grassroots organizers in every city are women of color. So their voices were um, being ignored. So I decided to create um, artwork that feature a strong women of color. So I brought back this poster, this little Palestinian girl that says, Salam, we're a peaceful people. Uh, dream, dignity and respect for all. Extend justice and equality for all, featuring uh, Angela Davis. And this is how they were used uh, in the streets. And then I, Re, I brought this same posters back and I put color on them. And now I was doing like 2,500 2, posters for the people uh, being distributed, distributed in different uh, cities around the US, well, around California, specifically uh, here in Sacramento, Santa Rosa, Stockton, San Francisco, Oakland, and Los Angeles. And everything was uh, sponsored by uh, women of color. I call them Mujeres Chingonas. Shout out to all of them for uh, putting the money so we can print and put conscious Chicano artwork in the hands of the people. Then I collaborated with my student, uh, Viola Lebeau, who is from the Pitt River Nation. Uh, she graduated uh, last year from Mills uh, uh, studying uh, Native American studies. And we created this to bring awareness to the missing uh, and murdered indigenous women. Uh, and it says, no more stolen sisters, sacred. I took a photograph of her and we made it into a poster. And here's how the work was used in Santa Rosa here in Sacramento. For some reason, my pictures are pixelated. I don't know what happened. And um, this past summer, I uh, created artwork for the Black, Black Lives Matter uprising. So I made this poster, fuck the police, Black Lives Matter. And I was like really angry of everything that was happening so, you know, I decided to put my rage into, channel my rage into these posters. Uh, Migre Policia, La Misma Porqueria. And here's how they were used in the, in the streets. We had an event called Black and Brown, Shut It Down. And we uh, passed hundreds of posters and we had a few thousand people that came out in support and we marched from Southside Park to the state capitol. And then did a, I did a, a lot of the buildings were bordered up around downtown. So I decided to uh, make a collage on some of those um, wood uh, frames that were uh, in businesses. And this was right uh, in front of Andy's Candies uh, to send a message. And the last, the most recent one that I did in support of uh, the unmanagement movement that Brittany was uh, talking about, I made this poster of Junipero Sierra. It says asesino, asesino means killer. And I put like some of the real history that he was responsible for. Uh, and that evening, um, the Curipiro Sierra statue at the state capitol was uh, monumented. The people took care of business, the city uh, and the state were very slow uh, bringing the statues down. The people took uh, matter into their own hands and they uh, uh, monumented that, that killer. And the last picture that I wanna show you is this one, abolished ice, uh, not one more. And this is in support uh, of closing all the concentration camps, all the camps where they had little children uh, from Central America and that they have separated those families and they're still trying to find the parents of these children. So here's some of the work that, uh, that I have created. Uh, this is more recently, but my work spans uh, two decades of supporting and creating our work for the masses. Thank you so much, Chico. You're welcome. Okay, Lorena. Thank you so much for having me. I'm actually gonna put my timer on. <laughs> okay.
because five minutes does go really quick. Um, so I wanted to thank you for inviting me and um, I'm just uh, honored to be uh, here alongside all these amazing panelists um, and a fellow historian as well, Cecilia. <laughs> Um, I admire your work. And so I think that um, one of the things that was mentioned already was the importance of local history and preserving that history. And I do want to say that the Center for Sacramento History was instrumental uh, for me in, um, in, work, in working on first on my dissertation and later my book um, on Sacramento. I focus on the Chicana Chicano movement of the 1960s and 70s. Um, my first chapter does look at uh, pre-Columbian times, um, and it stretches all the way um, into the 1950s before I begin what I call the Chicana Chicano movement. So um, I think that it's really difficult for us to shatter these romanticized notions of what California was, of what the, uh, the gold rush was for California. We know that it devastated not only uh, the indigenous populations uh, through disease, but also devastated the environment. Um, and I think that environmental studies can absolutely begin here uh, in, in the way in which folks began to mine and use, um, I'm not sure if I'm using the right term, but hydro something. <laughs> um, and how all of those chemicals went into uh, our, our rivers um, that we esteem so much in Sacramento. I mean, um, I also want to um, talk a little bit about John Setter, and um, I know there was, and I, and I do think we, we owe a lot of credit to the Black Lives Matter movement for forcing us to um, deal and reckon with um, some of that history. I don't think ever in my life I would have thought that we would even consider taking down John Setter. Um, I am from also this area. And so I was taken to Sutter's Fort and I was told all this stuff of the pioneers of Sacramento and not knowing the devastation um, that it caused along the way. So one of the things I would like to see, I think I'm supposed to say this later, but maybe some monuments of native peoples, um, Asian, I'm thinking here of Chinese specifically um, uh, who mined, uh, in the gold rush and also Mexicans. And so one of the things that uh, uh, gold, gold rush scholars have tried to do in the last 15 to 20 years to, is to shatter some of these romanticized notions. We know that gold country was very diverse. It included folks from uh, Chile, Chileans, Mexicans, Hawaiian Islanders, African-Americans, many of which were brought here as slaves, Native Americans, Chinese, and also uh, Anglo-Americans from uh, the, the, um, uh, the East Coast. Uh, and this is all before um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed on February 2nd, 1848. So um, it is considered a multicultural, multiracial, multilingual uh, place. At the same time, it was very violent. And so um, there were lynch mobs that um, went after Mexican and Chinese immigrants and Chileans as well. Um, we talk about lynching in the American South, I'm sorry, in the American South, but we don't talk about it here in California. It was very effective, a way of terrorizing uh, uh, these communities of color, of seeing Mexicans uh, as foreigners, uh, and yet we have these traces of Mexicans in these areas, especially uh, in what was uh, known as the Southern Mines, which was around Stockton, California. Um, you hear and you have read diaries of folks talking. You could hear a lot of Spanish spoken on the street. And so we know that these communities existed. We also know that folks from the state of Sonora, uh, which is the Northern state in Mexico, uh, made their way. This is also one of the largest migrations, the first largest migrations of Mexicans into the state of California and especially Northern California. Many had settled mostly in Southern California, but now we have large migrants of Mexicans to um, Northern California settling here. Uh, these miners don't go away altogether. Uh, they make communities, they settle, they raise families. We know, for instance, that I was able to locate in the Sacramento Union 
and Sacramento Bee that the first Cinco de Mayo celebration was uh, in 1864, just two years after the Battle of Puebla of 1862, that they celebrated um, and had a dance. <laughs> so they're dancing with somebody. <laughs> so we know that there's there, that this community, community exists. Uh, we also know that there was a foreign miners tax that was imposed mostly on Mexican and what was uh, called back then South American entities, um, and they were uh, charged $20 a month to mine in the gold mines because they were considered foreigners. Um, and so I want to say that this is the beginning of racialized propositions that target minorities, uh, um, sorry, communities of color, and uh, very effectively. And I think that this is the beginning of what will be a very racialized state and attacking communities of color. And that's where I will end. Thank you so much. Um, I want to take a moment to remind our viewers to post questions in the Q&A. Um, OK, so we're going to move on to the second prompt. Um, and this one, like I said, will be a little more of a round table. Uh, so I guess we're going to switch to kind of a gallery view. Um, and again, I invite you each to respond to each other as you go. And starting again with Veronica, please take just two to three minutes each to share some thoughts on the question, what are some ways in which artists, scholars, community advocates, and activists can be integrated or could be integrated into urban planning and policy discussions? Um. As I was saying, the center is very interested in um, working with um, different members of the community, activists, artists, scholars, to help us be able to tell these stories that a lot of people have been talking about, the, the underrepresented and people who haven't had a voice. And um, <clears throat> what we've been doing is to, to get us, to help us to get there, or we've taken some initiatives. Um, We've created a community advisory committee and it's made up of scholars from UC Davis, Lorena is on it, um, uh, Milman Harrison, who is a, a professor of African American studies at UC Davis. We have scholars from CSUS, we have community activists. Um, um, <clears throat> and um, these uh, our, our people are helping us um, make connections with um, some of these communities advising us on, on um, content for different projects that we're developing. Um, one of them is we're creating short uh, videos on the history of racism in Sacramento. And this is being used for city staff to learn how to recognize racial inequity and, uh, um, and to help educate them. And hopefully the, the larger community will be able to utilize these. We also have a team um, that's working with us to um, do some minor revisions on our existing Native American exhibit. Um, and we're also wanting to have them help us in long-term term planning for our exhibit when we redo it. Um, <clears throat> and we have a video series about the Chinese experience, um, some short videos that um, we're going to have people talking about that um, from the 19th century. So I see, um, I guess my vision is that we can hopefully have artists and scholars and community activists. I'm, I'd love to get uh, school children into the, the uh, museum to um, talk about some of the problems that the, um, some uh, groups may have had um, working um, on, on projects like that, We're looking at internships. Um, we want to bring in artists to possibly do um, some type of artwork in connection with planning for exhibits. So there are a lot of different ideas that we have um, where we really want to reach out and we hope that um, that the kind of future planning for the city includes places, public places where we can have outdoor um, activities and we can work with these groups um, to provide this kind of outreach to the public. Thank you, Veronica. Um, and again, feel free to comment on each other, each other's um, proposals. Um, Brittany, 
you're next. So I want to take something that I just saw in the chat that I think is really important and the disappointment that there's no Nisanan, Miwok, or Maidu people on this webinar. Um, I'm from the Hoopa Valley tribe. I don't represent the people that are from this area. And I think that's a really important point to make. There are so many amazing Nisanan, Miwok, and Maidu artists and still present and here and advocates that are still present and here in that space um that are working on reclaiming their histories through either collaborations with state parks or doing artwork um, that represents that so i'm thinking right now the shingle springs band of miwok indians who have an amazing gallery in their um in their tribal offices and then have a really strong gallery team really strong cultural resources team that comes out and does that kind of work and has been working with us at state parks towards that end um, i also want to give a shout out to anthony burris who was the mellon public scholar through the dhi who worked with state parks on this project and has really been instrumental in um, organizing and collaborating with the tribes in the area so something that i really want to note is that the is something that rose also pointed out as well in the chat is that what happened in california to california indian people is a genocide and it was intentional extreme it was an intentional genocide by the state of california and that's something that we have to talk about and name when we're talking about the history of the state. Um, because this land, we're still here. We're still Native and Indigenous people that are here, maintain connections to this space. And the Nesanon and Miwok and Maidu people maintain their connections to the Sacramento Valley. And I think that's really, really important to point out. And I hope that you know the DHI will invite more Nesanon, Miwok, and Maidu peoples to come and speak truth to power to their history, because I, I I'm happy to be here and I'm really happy to talk about that conversation. But it really, really needs to be them that's talking about their their gold their history, the gold rush, and the challenges that they faced in this valley. Thank you, Brittany, and um, and thank you to the viewer for that comment. Um, Tiffany is still not here, so um, Cecilia, uh, you can go next. Good. So um, I have two po specific points related to how uh, scholars and historians, in particular, can um, work with the city, and and um, so. My first point is that, I mean, it's kind of an obvious one that we can um, help the city to provide historical interpretation of existing sites and expand and revise the content that's presented there, ensuring that it's accurate, inclusive, and draws on the most up-to-date scholarship. And we're already doing this. So, um, for example, my colleagues in the history department have been um, involved with the National Park Service to provide historical context essays for a number of sites in California. I've done some of this work at the county level in the Bay Area. Um, and two of our graduate students actually were recently awarded Mellon Public Scholars Fellowship specifically for projects in Sacramento. And I believe they're working in conjunction with um, the organizations represented by some of the, the panelists. So one is going to work with the California Tribal Affairs Program to develop a Native American history walking tours at Sutter's Fort. And, uh, Marshall Gold Discovery Park in Coloma, and we have another graduate student working with um, the Center for Sacramento History to help develop collections related to the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and Asian populations during the gold rush. And so like um, it was mentioned earlier that uh, some of this will go towards exhibits at the Sacramento History Museum. And so I think that historians will need to continue and expand on this important work. And then my second one is to, to maybe think about historic sites that are not recognized or they're are not existing as historic sites um, right now, um, or maybe because those spaces no longer exist. And here I'm, I'm thinking of the example of a Sacramento Chinatown, or sorry, Japantown, which was once one of the largest um, in the country after San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, in San Jose. So this um, was a, a community east of the Tower Bridge and Sacramento River where Capitol Mall is. 
was established in the 1890s on 4th Street. Um, and so uh, in 1840, or sorry, in 1940, it was a thriving neighborhood with many businesses and churches and um, civic organizations. Um, and of course, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II left Japantown um, kind of deserted, but much of it was rebuilt after the war. And then it was dismantled again with redevelopment in the 1950s and residents protested, but um, they were forced to basically start over twice in a decade. And any traces of Sacramento, Japantown have almost completely um, vanished. And so I think most Sacramento residents are not much aware of this. There was an exhibit um, at the California Museum a few years ago um, about this, but I think this is the type of hidden local history that I, I hope scholars can help bring to light and work with city planners, commissions, museums, um, artists, and community members to make these histories uh, visible in meaningful ways to the public. Thanks. Thank you so much. Chico, what ideas do you have? So uh, uh, one of the things that I was, um, that I wrote down was like the first step to be part of an urban planning discussion is an invitation. And I think by the comments on, on the chat, we definitely can, can see that, right? And by the acknowledgement of Brittany uh, about those missing voices. So definitely an invitation is, is, is all we, uh, you know, we need sometimes to get a seat at the table. Um, we have lots of cultural multicultural organizations here in Sacramento that never or rarely uh, get a seat at the table. So definitely, you know, outreach to uh, to community folks. I know that uh, the Sacramento History Museum outreach to Soul Collective, and now we have a partnership. We do this big Dia de los Muertos celebration every year. Uh, it, it's beautiful to see like danzantes aztecas, to see you know uh, cultura and you know multi multi generational uh, participants. So that's something that's something that you know our city like definitely needed, and I'm glad that we're celebrating celebrating that um, in in public and with one another. Um, there are lots of very capable and knowledgeable uh, people of all ages that will be willing to to partake in said discussions. There's also organizations that oftentimes get overlooked for their work, and they're putting a lot of a lot of time and effort into what they're doing. I can mention NorCal Resist. They're doing an incredible job in our communities, providing like food and providing like funds for people to pay their rent and their utilities. And they're focusing on undocumented people that hope that don't have access to stimulus checks that are have lost their jobs and they're like struggling. So they're putting a lot of time into, into doing that. There's also an organization called Cafe. Uh, it's called Clothing and Food for Everyone. Uh, there are there are Cesar Chavez Park every Sunday. Uh, providing like meals and food and clothing uh, for the people, so that's another another uh, organization that don't get a lot of, a lot of love, and they're doing incredible work, right? They they don't get the news, uh, you know, to do like segments on them. They don't get the newspaper, but they're doing amazing work. They since uh, the pandemic started, uh, NorCal Resist has given about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to undocumented communities in the greater Sacramento area. Um, so they're doing, they're doing excellent work. I invite all of you uh, to Google this organization, Soul Collective, Cafe, and um, NorCal Resist and support it any way you can. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of indigenous organizations out, out there that also need that love and support. Uh, and you know, people are doing excellent work, support them. Support them with your funds, support them any way you can by sharing some of the, uh, the work that they're doing on your social media. I mean, we're, all, we're in this together, right? So let's support one another. Thank you. And you're so right. There's so many people out there doing amazing work and you're also so right about all you need is an invitation. That was well put and I concur. Um, Lorena, you are next and last. Yeah, so um, I think one of the ways in which we can um, move forward is uh, to support graduate students who do work on Sacramento, um, especially marginalized communities. Um, I know for myself, when I was a graduate student, I couldn't afford to pay for the printing, so I would sit there for hours and months uh, typing away on my computer. 
Um, and so I think like if we can support graduate students, um, you know, who are doing uh, this work that needs to be done because we can talk about it. And um, unless, unless we get the publications out, um, it's not gonna reach, I don't think um, scholarly audiences. And, um, and then therefore we can, I think, begin to shape Sacramento into this sort of um, complex place that it is. I also um, think we should support ethnic studies uh, in K through 12. Uh, education. I know that, uh, you know, that's been circulating for some time now, but I think um, students shouldn't wait till they get to college to learn about Chicano, Chicano history. You know, they shouldn't wait to learn about Asian American, African American, Native American history. At UC Davis, we're fortunate that the ethnic studies um, disciplines have, have been there since 69. Um, and so, uh, we have uh, a doctoral program in Native American studies. History does great work um, as well uh, in, in sort of turning out the, these scholars. Um, I also think that it's important that we show up and do the work. Um, and it's, it's um, you know, and make sure that our voices are heard and our concerns are also heard. Um, and Sacramento continues to be a very diverse place. Uh, and I think that that is the beauty of Sacramento. I love Sacramento. And um, I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, I'm, just one, I'm just one voice of many. Um, and so um, I think that's, that's all I have to say. That was great. Well, thank you all for um, the beginning of the conversation. <clears throat> um, I am going to open it up to the to questions now. I have a list of questions, but I first wanted to give each of you or any of you who have questions for each other a, a chance to ask them. We only have twenty minutes for the Q and A, so um, but I do want to I do want to open up the space to you guys first. Does anybody have? a burning question to ask each other. We do have an, a long list of questions from the audience. So if you don't, I'll, I'll just go to those. Okay. All right. So the first question, um, kind of two questions that um, we're, I'm going to put together from Hillary Rennick has a question for Veronica. How has the Center for Sacramento History collaborated with local tribes slash nations and Elizabeth McKee asks a follow-up question, does the center have many collections of archival materials from these peoples? Um, good question. Actually, we have not um, collaborated with the tribes. Um, we, <clears throat> we have small Native American exhibit. Um, one of the reasons is that there is the um, State Indian Museum. And so our um, exhibits and, and collections have been minimal because we have, have let the collection state parks take care of that. Doesn't mean we want to ignore that the groups by any stretch of imagination. And that's one of the reasons why we've put together this community advisory committee. Um, um, Dr. Mona Siegel, who's from CSUS, um, Cal Snyder, Dr. Cal Snyder, also CSUS, um, are on our community advisory group. And, we want to start making those connections because we want to be able to, as I said, tell those stories. Um, we don't, um, um, uh, the second, there was two parts of that question. I'm sorry. What was the second part? Hold on. Um, does the center have many collections of archival materials from me? And <clears throat> again, we have let the state museum, um, state parks handle that. Um, as far as archival materials, those are also very difficult um, to get a hold of, and um, that would be the state park. So one of the, the, the issues we're coming from, too, is that we don't have a lot of, of items. Um, and we also want to talk about not just Native Americans back then, you know, they, there are still people here, and that's what we want to make sure that the public doesn't, you know, a lot of times they don't have that understanding. So we want to work with um, the groups to make sure that we tell the complete story from, from the 
um, before you know any any of the gold miners and it came all the way up to the present. Thank you. Okay, second question um, from uh, anonymous. What kind of spaces in the city are crucial to Sacramento public memory and identity? Should some of these be rethought and remade? We're thinking here. Um, we're thinking here in part of how the U.S. is beginning to reckon with Confederate monuments. So, um, great question, multi-part, and I think that's for all of you. Who wants to dive in? Well, I think the um, I'm sorry, the Sutter statue is an interesting um, topic or, or um, one example to bring up. Um, um, you know, a lot of people have that um, opinion of, of Sutter that they've been taught since, um, you know, grade school. And it's interesting to see that um, that call to take the statue down. Um, it's, it, we, the center got a little bit of, of calls about that because this, but the statue is owned actually by a private entity, which is one of the reasons why it probably took so long for anything to happen is because they really chose to not, you know, make any issue about it. So I, but I, to me, that's just a, a good example of people starting to identify even here um, that, that there are a lot of those hidden histories and there are a lot of um, um, tributes to the people that were always in charge, but not to the people who were doing the work. So, um, sorry if you don't mind me jumping in. Uh, to the Sutter statue issue, we were able to collaborate with um, Morning Star Galley with the Anti Police Terror Project, and then um, Wilton Rancheria and some of the representatives from the tribe to host a sit in, a teach in at the site. Um, and that was a with the collaboration of state parks to talk about this history of John Sutter and what that history has done to the people in the Sacramento Valley. So it was really interesting to have folks come together and really do like a community-based socially distanced discussion about what how we talk about history, both at Sutter's Four and other places across Sacramento that state parks manages, but also across the state of California. Like why are native histories invisibilized? What does that mean when the state invisibilizes these histories and how do we move forward in um, making uplifting Maidu Nisanan and Miwok stories of the Sacramento Valley. And so in our collaborations recently with tribes, we've been discussing potentials for like art installations, um, new reinterpretation of those sites, like diff many different things that uh, go, that has a very close collaboration with the tribes um, in question that have that history. And this is happening all across the state too. It's not just in Sacramento, it's in the many areas where the whole state of California, which is indigenous land, um, and having those conversations about the way that state parks has for a long time interpreted this history that is inherently very violent. Um, the creation of the state is very violent. And so um, it's been, I think a real changing point for the state of California. And it really rests on this tribal advocacy and the ag advocacy of folks who have been pushing for these um, changes for a very, very long time. Can I ask um, uh, how many people and, and what um, who showed up at the teach-in? Because I mean, for me, the taking down of monuments is, is precisely just, you know, it's an opportunity for education. If it's if it's merely the, remo the removal of an offensive symbol, which needs to be removed, and there's all sorts of cathartic, you know, important sort of reasons for people to take down statues, you know. Um, but if it's just that, then, uh, you know, um, those who don't understand why statues are being taken down are just gonna, you know, there's all sorts of things that they say. Um, so 
I'm just, I'm very curious as to, I don't know who showed up, how word was spread, you know, how many people were actually um, um, involved. Yeah, so the organizations that, the organization that put it together, um, like spread it over social media, the tribe, I know the tribes that were involved too, spread it over social media. And so there were about 20 or 30 people that were maybe a little bit less that were on site, like spread out. If you've been to Sutter's Fort, you know, it's a big like field kind of. So mm -hmm. folks were spread out and then they had like a amplifying, like a um, microphone system set up and everything. And then it was streamed on Facebook Live. So folks that couldn't come were able to come and listen and talk, um, will listen and interact in that way. Um, but it was really interesting to have this conversation that has been had, I think, in indigenous communities for a very long time, but now open and out there to the public. Um, so actually the district superintendent was there hearing like this information and he's been incredibly supportive in um, rethinking this interpretation um, at the parks, at that park. And, and that's a, quite a change from even 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's really a lot of community power that comes together and helps to shape those um, narratives. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, does anybody else want to add um, anything to, to this question? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you both for your great answers. Kelly Brown asks, thank you for acknowledging the impact of these missing histories on our children. I have a fourth grader as well and was wondering if any of the panelists can recommend resources for parents to access as they help their children try and learn the wider histories of California. As a native of Sacramento, it's been a process of learning myself. Yeah, thank right, you for that right. question. Um, and I wanted also maybe this links back to um, this previous question, but I, I want to um, also think broadly about how um, what's been mentioned is that the great work that different organizations and tribes are doing um, and that you know it is getting more publicized, but I'm also wondering how we can connect um, the yeah, kind of scholarship and activists and bring that to um, kind of the, the wider public, including to uh, K-12 teachers who are um, teaching this history and who are now more aware and have the desire to um, teach these more inclusive histories in their classrooms, but might not have the resources or um, know exactly how to how to go about that. And so how, and also, yeah, I wanna think broadly about how we can um, provide them and equip them with um, the resources. And in my um, other capacity in the history department is I'm, um, the faculty advisor of the history project and so I would uh, recommend that as one resource you can check out um, our website and we um, are uh, housed in the history department but we uh, provide uh, k-12 teacher professionalization and training um, to in history and social science um, and and uh, across the state and so our region that we cover is the, Sac the greater Sacramento area there are uh, numerous other sites throughout the state that do this um, for other Sites I can recommend, um, Calisphere is, is something that, uh, that they have curated um, primary sources and there are some context pieces and I think teachers have found that useful. Um, through the California Historical Society, um, our, we helped to develop this Teaching California um, source set. So it comes with primary sources that teachers can use and um, again, the context for um, teaching them. And so, um, yeah, so those I think parents can check out and I'm interested in kind of bringing a lot of this knowledge and these resources to teachers throughout the state and then partnering with museums and tribes and other groups um, to do this. I just wanted to add that there was actually a follow up to that question, kind of a part two, how should changes be made and how these histories are taught to school children in California? Um, what do you think of the ethnic studies debate in California education? I don't know if Lorena wants to um, take that on, but that's part, part of the work we're doing is also to support the implementation of ethnic studies um, curriculum uh, in the schools. And so we um, yeah, are, are fully in support of that. Um, in, I mean, it, 
in the history department, we're not all trained as ethnic studies scholars, but um, that, you know, that is a lot of the background and interests that I, I have. So I don't know if Rowena wants to add more. Specific. Yeah, I was just going to say Chico's an educator, so he, he probably, I just wanted to add that um, it really is a disservice to the state of California, which is the most diverse. Uh, Latino students in particular make up over 50% of all K through 12. Um, and so the numbers are staggering. Um, for, for a very long time, this population has grown and continues to grow and they continue to be marginalized. And, um, and so it, it's really, I think, shameful for our students to arrive uh, to the university and learn for the first time and then have all of these emotions come up. Like, why didn't I know this history? I mean, the power of belonging, the power of hearing your history told um, cannot be measured. Uh, it's very empowering. Uh, it's not a knock to anybody. It's the, the history of this, of this country. It's the way people have contributed. Um, it does us no good to think of Latinos, for instance, as recent immigrants. It does us no good to think of uh, Asian Americans as recent immigrants. Uh, they have paved the way. Uh, literally through blood and sweat and so much sacrifice um, uh, in this country, and especially in the state of California. And there, it's, it has not been an easy process. Um, we have carried the brunt of racism in this country. It's a real thing. It's happening today. Uh, and unless we can come to terms with the past, I do not see any way we can begin to heal. Uh, and so people keep saying, well, you know, this is a moment of reconciliation. Well, you know, there's like centuries of this uh, and um, it, it's not just one story, it's many, many stories. And um, so that's why I am a full supporter of ethnic studies uh, and we really need uh, to do a lot of work. And luckily we're in California where that history is so present. And we have so, so many examples to draw from, uh, including in this region of Sacramento, um, which I feel like I'm a proud product of. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a high school teacher right now. And um, I, was a, I was a college professor, uh, an adjunct faculty professor. And one of the reasons that I decided to become a high school teacher was because for the reasons that Lorena is mentioning. A lot, of, a lot of my students in Chicano studies, introduction to Chicano studies, introduction to Chicano culture, introduction, introduction to Chicano art, it was like the first time that they saw themselves reflected in a, in, in a curriculum. So that was, uh, it was very impactful. And I was like, you know, it's a shame that they're not learning this when they're younger, right? A lot of the students when I was teaching at UC Davis came from like little towns. And in little towns, you see who are the sons of the, of the ranchers and who are the sons and daughters of the campesinos, right, the farm workers. So there is this big, very big distinction. And a lot of the kids grow up with like inferiority complexes because the system is designed to do that. So I, I'm in full support of ethnic studies. We're already teaching ethnic studies at our high school. Not only that, we have a danza Azteca class that we teach at our high school. So we can reconnect some of the Chicano students or their indigenous roots. And what is happening here in California and what is happening here in the US is also happening in Mexico. It's also happening in South, South and Central America and the Caribbean because colonizers went there too. And there are statues uh, erected um, for Pizarro, for uh, Colón, for Cortes, and all those are being brought down, you know? And somebody mentioned like violence nobody's getting hurt you know this is that just i made out of bronze or whatever and they're being brought down because there is a long history of oppression you know that has been perpetrated for 500 years even today if you look at mexican telenovelas the actors and actresses are light-skinned people and the indigenous looking people are the maids and the servants and all this and that right so all that is still in, in play because of what happened with colonization so when we're bringing down statues there's no harm in that, that, uh, you know, the state and the local governments are not acting quickly and people are fed up, you know, and I hope that, uh, you know, we can dismantle like white fragility and bring ethnic studies into the K through A system too. 
Thank you. Um, we have so many great questions and I, we only have five minutes left. So I'm trying to decide which one to ask next. Um, Jonathan Radike asks, how can we better align the public humanities advocacy work that we do within universities, public history centers and other institutions with the mutual aid and community building work that grassroots organizations like NorCal Resist, Soul Collective, the Anti-Police Terror Project Sacramento and many others are doing. I feel like that builds on some of what we were just talking about that maybe, maybe you can say a few words, any of you. So these organizations are already doing the work, right? So, you know, just jump in. Um, they are in social media, at Soul Collective, at NorCal Resist. Uh, you know, you can just, you know, friend them and see what, what they need. Um, they are like doing great work and they can always, you know, expand their operations. So if you if go online and Google them and if you like their mission and their vision, jump in. They're, they're more than welcome. They're always looking for people. And they're going to do their work regardless if they get, you know, uh, money from institutions or anything. They're grassroots. Yeah. I think the question is is also more about how you know we can align the you know our public scholars and our um, public humanities types programs. I mean, what what we can do to further develop those relationships. And I and I think you know yeah, it is a, a question of outreach. And I know that when we publicize our events, we also publicize them in social media. And I'm I'm not the person who does that. I don't know that much about social media, but I know that you know tagging and and you know just being seen by other organizations and mutually already just kind of exponentially expands the network. I mean, it's, it's pretty astounding. Um, okay, um, I do wanna ask this question. How has the pandemic changed Sacramento and its development? How do you think it will change the city going forward? Big question, maybe just a few thoughts. Well, obviously, it's, it's uh, exposed the inequalities in health <laughs> uh, as black and brown communities have uh, suffered um, uh, the highest death rates of uh, COVID. Uh, we're talking about multi-generational households. We're talking about uh, working class, working poor folks. We're talking about people who are at the front line, who are risking their lives daily. I mean, to me, it's not news. It really isn't, um, but it does definitely um, give us, I think, the statistical information that we need in order to make change. And so one of the things I always like to think is like, there's so much work that's needed in our communities that you can be anything you want, as long as you are there for change and to make things more equitable, uh, whether it's, you know, in the medical field, whether you wanna teach, whether, there's, there's just so, so much work. I'm actually frightened to see what has happened to the children who have been home, uh, some of them unsupervised because parents need to work. I mean, we really do not know. I mean, I know some stories, but um, I my children are privileged. They're home safe with me. Um, and so, uh, but I have nieces and nephews who don't have uh, the resources my kids have. And so I, I, it's, it's so devastating to see every day on the news. Um, and we really don't know until next year, I think, um, what that means, what learning loss means and how that impacts brown and black communities, especially uh, and working class communities. Um, and Sacramento is absolutely there. Uh, as the disparities we've looked at, oh, Oak Park and we've looked at um, Southland Park. Uh, there's been studies of uh, already made there. I mean, there's just, there's so much. And then we have uh, the rise of, um, you know, police brutality and bringing awareness to that and high incarceration. I mean, I in, in my opinion, there's a shift um, and it's really um, maximizing on that, writing that and really pushing 
pushing the limits as much as we can to make sustainable and lasting change. I think that is what um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do in this, in this time period. Thank you. We are we are out of time. Um, so that was um, that was a, a powerful way to end. I want to thank you all so very much for your for your contributions um, and for everything that you're doing. And I hope that um, this is just the beginning of multiple conversations between us um, and between um, us and the public. I want to remind everybody that we have two more events coming up in this series. Um, each on the third Thursday of the month. So that's one way to remember it. Um, the next one is uh, Black Sacramento, as I mentioned earlier, on Thursday, April 15th, again at 5.10 p.m. Um, and the, no, the one after that is called Looking Ahead, Lessons from Oakland Saint-Denis. And I actually um, was going to be reaching out to the Soul Collective to, um, for their participation in this. Um, and I'm they've been mentioned quite a bit during this session. So you can find all that information on our website, dhi.ucdavis.edu uh, forward slash conversation for the full information on the conversation series. And you can also sign up for our newsletter to find out about all of our other events and opportunities. And thank you all so much once again. It was really a pleasure um, hearing you and, and sharing in your knowledge. Have a good evening. Bye.